Hello, Berlin. It's such an incredible privilege to be here at the 10th anniversary of CSS Conf EU. Now, I was here in Berlin at CSS Conf and JS Conf for the very first time in my life last year, and it was one of the most amazing experiences of my life. So I really want to thank the organizers for bringing me out again and organizing this spectacular event. Now, I know I discovered from a colleague of mine, Alex Lakatos, he's somewhere in the audience, that the DevTools console can totally be styled up with CSS. Case in point, this glorious CSS-only talk title in the console. So my name is Hui Jing, and I'm a developer advocate with Nexmo. If you've never heard of us, uh, well, Alex built this coffee app that some of you will be using tomorrow to order coffee. My colleague Garen will also be speaking at JSConf. We're really friendly people, and Nexmo does communications APIs, and do, just come say hi if you've got a minute, right? I'm also an avid lover of emojis, and this, they, these pretty much sum up what, who I am as a person. If you're curious about any one of them, you can ask me about them later. And lastly, just to prove a point that Firefox supports the most CSS properties in the console, I mean, it's vertical writing in the console. So I don't know about you, but I love it. Now, when I started building stuff on the web, I quickly realized that aligning stuff horizontally was way more easy than aligning stuff vertically. And I started thinking about why that was. Now, historically, Web technology started off from text document beginnings, and a lot of the initial HTML tags and CSS properties focused mainly on text formatting. For languages you know, like English and French that were laid out predominantly from uh, horizontally from top to bottom. So boxes on the web, and the web is made up of boxes, right? Boxes on the web behaved very similarly, but that was clearly insufficient for what most designers and developers had in mind when it came to doing layout on the web. So when I refer to modern CSS layouts, I'm talking about layouts that are built with Flexbox, with Grid, with the box alignment properties, because conceptually, these are the properties which were crafted specially for doing layout on the web. They were very different from the prior techniques that we had, like, say, you know, HTML tables for layout or even floats because those were more clever uses of properties whose intended purpose was not for layout to begin with. But resourceful developers like yourselves found plenty of workarounds and hacks to work with whatever features were available at the time. And today, we have a much more robust tool set for doing layouts on the web. So the first thing I want to cover today is content-based sizing, or what I call letting the browser do more. Now, the concept of automatic sizing has always existed on the web. I mean, browsers have always managed to figure out how much space content should take up without any intervention from us. The content just reflows without overlapping. But what is introduced in this relatively newer CSS spec called CSS Intrinsic and Extrinsic Module Level 3 is that it introduces some keywords that allow us to apply automatic widths onto our elements on the page. So now, the sizing properties of width and height take in three additional keyword values, namely min content, max content, and hopefully better supported in the future, fit content. So if we look at this first block of uh, content here, I've sized them with min content. And I hope you can sort of see, I'll just pull this up a bit. It's sized with min content, and min content is the smallest size that a box can take, which doesn't lead to overflow. So inline content, if I could point your direction here, you'll see that the inline content will break into multiple lines. Now, line breaking has a lot more nuance than most people give it credit for, because depending on the language that is being used on screen, min content is going to end up looking very differently, and the lines will break differently as well. For a lot of languages, most, mostly the Latin-based scripts like English or German, line breaks will occur at word boundaries, where spaces or punctuation are used to explicitly separate the words. One key thing to note is that the browser will not 
break words. So in this instance, the word content plus the full stop at the end is treated as a single unbreakable entity, and that is, that is why the, this particular box size, the width ends up being the, this width of the content plus the full stop. But for languages like Chinese or Japanese, the line break is per character, usually, but not always, because there are, there are rules about certain characters that they, they're not allowed to start or end on a line. And East Asian languages also use something known as a full width punctuation. So let's say I add a comma here. So a full width punctuation will take up the amount of space as a standard square Han character. So now the min content becomes two Ms instead of one. Now, there are also some Southeast Asian scripts like Thai, which do not have spaces between words. So if you'll look at the second set of content that is sized with max content, and let's talk about max content for a bit, max content is a box's ideal size in a given axis when there's unlimited space. So usually what's going to happen is that the content is going to take up as much space as required to lay itself out on one line without breaking. So if you look at the thigh sentence here, you'll notice that no spaces. So if you don't read thigh, and I don't know if anybody reads thigh in the audience, you probably won't know where, where the word's going to break. But the longest word in that sentence is prayok right here, and that's what ends up being the min content of this uh, thigh language block. So now, fit content, if you can see here, unfortunately, it's not supported in the browser, because if you look at it, the inspector is going to tell you, oh, hey, sorry, invalid property value. But fit content does work in a grid formatting context. And so that's what we're going to be looking at with these last three pieces of content. Now, I've got three languages. And fit content is not a fixed value like the previous two keywords of min content and max content. It is a range where the minimum value is min content, while the maximum value is either the max content value or the value that you put inside this function, whichever is smaller. So this makes more sense if I show you what's going on. Now, I think it's better to look at the, the second and third because they have exactly the same content. So if I shift this and we run out of space, it's going to shrink, shrink, shrink until it's the min content uh, width for both. But if we expand it, it will grow until. So the value that I've used now here is 300 pixels. So it, it's going to be 300. I know it's really, really small. Take my word for it. That's 300. Same goes for the thigh, uh, the thigh content as well. But if I change the fit content cap to something slightly larger, I'm going to change it to 500, and then we'll grow some more, you'll notice that it doesn't, it doesn't reach 500. It actually stops at the max content. In this case, it's 462. In this case, it's 320-something. So that's how these three content-based sizing values work. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is Flexbox, you know, the layout model where no one knows exactly the size of anything, but hopefully I can help shed some light on this apparent mystery. Now, when we, when we want to learn about Flexbox, Firefox really shines through because as of now, it's the only browser that has a Flexbox inspector. So we can find it by going to the layout panel, and you can toggle it by clicking on this toggle here. You can also choose to click on this, um, I would call it a tag maybe in the inspector. And what happens when we toggle it is that it will show you the outline of each of your flex items and any free space available as this kind of a texture thing. And if we look at the layout panel, they also tell you the flex direction and the wrap status. But more importantly, the Flexbox inspector will tell you what it does to flex items when they grow or shrink. And we'll cover this in more detail in the next couple of examples. And one thing I want to remind everyone is that the specification actually recommends that we use keyword values on flex items because they cover the most common use cases and they reset the values within the three flex, uh, flex properties appropriately. So what's going to happen is that these keywords are initial, none, 
auto and a positive integer which gets resolved to the flex grow factor. So initial is the default value for flex items if, say, I set a display flex on the parent and then I don't do anything to the children, it gets a value of display flex. And we can sort of figure out what the browser does when it encounters such keywords by going to the computer tab and then you turn on browser styles because these are styles that the browser sets. We never explicitly set them. You can filter for flex and what you'll find is that it'll tell you, oh, flex grow factor is zero, flex shrink is one, flex basis is auto when the flex value is initial. If I change this to something else, let's say flex none, right, which makes your flex items completely inflexible, and you go back to the computer tab, it'll tell you that, oh, now flex grow is zero, flex shrink is now also zero, and auto, and so on. So this is pretty useful if you want to figure out what the browser is actually doing. The exact algorithm that the browser uses to calculate flex item sizing is fairly complicated, but it is outlined in the specification if you're interested. Now, I think sizing gets confusing until we get a clearer understanding of what's going on with the flex basis property specifically. So, for example, if I put a fixed value of 100 pixels as the flex basis, it's not surprising that some people will expect to see a box of 100 pixels because we're very used to being in control of our sizing instructions. But flex basis is actually the starting point from which the size of the box is calculated. The key, here, key to remember here is the starting point. Because if the flex item is allowed to grow or shrink, odds are the final size will not be 100 pixels. So let's take a look at this next example. It's a rather basic example. And if you just look at it on face value, it seems like the browser is allocating space very arbitrarily, maybe based on content. But so let's break down exactly what's happening. So a reminder here is that, remember, the browser doesn't break words, right? So here we've got two flex containers. And both of them have a display flex set on the parent container, nothing on the children, which means they have a flex value of initial that resolves to 0, 1, and auto. 0 means that it's not going to grow beyond whatever space it's required. So this space, it won't grow to fill up this space. It won't grow to fill up this space because the flex grow, you don't, we do not allow the flex item to grow. But it does have a flex shrink value of 1, which means that if there isn't enough space, all the items are going to start shrinking at the same rate. So the moment I hit this width, both the second and third items are going to start shrinking. So by the time I hit this, this sort of a layout that we saw just now, you'll notice that the second item in the in, in this set has already shrunk, but the one here has not shrunk at all. And that's what that's the reason why, even though there's exactly the same content, the sizing is different. Now, with a flex basis of auto, what's going to happen is that this value resolves to content, which is an automatic size based on the content within the flex item. And typically, this is equivalent to the max content size. So when there is no explicit width set on a flex item, and the flex basis is also set to auto, the browser is going to use the content size as the starting point to calculate the width of the flex item. But if you have an explicit width set, so I'm going to do that for this particular item, I'm going to set a width of 200. The width becomes the starting point for the, bit, for the calculation of the flex item. And the Flexbox inspector will tell you this. It'll tell you, oh, hey, base size, 200. But if I have an explicit flex basis set, 0, 1, 300 this time, then the flex basis takes precedent, trumps everything, and now it'll tell you that, oh, the starting size now is 300 instead. So that's basically how it works. Now, if you look at this, the first column naturally cannot shrink anymore because, you know, that's the main content of Word. But if we shrink, both items will start to shrink together. But eventually, because there's exactly the same amount of content in both, the se both second items, they end up being the same main content at the end of the day. And the next, the next bit I want to explain is the difference between a flex basis of auto and a flex basis of zero. Because 
the, 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 this results in the size of your flex items behaving rather differently. So now again, I have two sets of three items, but this time they both they have the same content. They match in content. Both sets of flex items are allowed to grow and shrink, except that they get different grow factors. So for the first item, the grow factor is one. The second item, grow factor is two. Third item, grow factor is zero. Same goes for the second set. The distinction is that flex basis is auto for the first set. Flex basis is zero for the second set. So what happens now is that the available free space is for the first set of items is calculated from the total width of the container minus the width of the content in all three items. So this bit of space here and this bit of space here is the available free space. So this is easier to look at numbers in this instance. So when, I, when we select this, it tells us that, oh, some, the flex item has grown. And it has grown by, say, about 71.5% uh, pixels. So there's some sub-pixel rounding error. So it may not be exactly exact, but you know, 0.1 pixels, I think, is fine. So this is, the first, this is the amount of free space that the browser gave the first item. If you look at the second item, it's about 142, 143. So it's exactly double the amount of free space given. But if you look at the final size, it's about 300 to 400. So it's, they are not double of each other. If you like the effect of having a flex item that is double of an, an, another, you'll have to set the flex basis to 0, which is what's going to happen in this second set here. When you set the flex basis to 0, content size is 0. So the amount of free space that the browser starts allocating is actually the width of all three, uh, the width of the total container minus whatever min content width is for this particular third item, because that's the amount, that's as small as it's going to get. The browser's not going to break words. So free space is calculated here. And all of this space is up for grabs. So if you look at this, it, it, the flexibility, the flex grow is 300 and about 314. And for the second item, it's 628. So this is exactly double of the first item. So if that's the effect you're looking for, you probably have to look out for your flex basis. And that's, that's something that I wanted to clarify. Another, th another useful thing with these new modern layouts is the ability to use box alignment properties to align items. So again, we're going to turn on the flex overlay so we can see what's going on. Turn it on. And the flex box inspector, again, allows us to visualize the space and how it, the free space is distributed among the items. So box alignment properties were actually meant to be used across layout models, even though for now they're only applicable for flex and grid. It's written in the spec that eventually block formatting contexts can also use them. So look out for something like this in the future, hopefully. Now, my trick for remembering which properties al uh, apply to which axes is that I personally, I associate the word justify with like text processing, uh, text editors, like Microsoft Word, where they got those four icons in the toolbar, and that used for us to shift text around in a horizontal axis. So for a language like, say, English or German, when I see justify, I think, oh, that's the direction that text flows. And because there are only two axes, right? So naturally, the other word, which is align, goes along the vertical axis. That really helped me remember. I hope it'll help. Maybe it helps you remember. I don't know. But when we're using Flexbox, only four out of the six available alignment properties are available, because justify items and justify self do not apply. They are meant to justify a box within its containing block along the main axis, but when you have a flex formatting context, there's more than one item in the main axis, so it doesn't really work. What we can use, though, is justify content. So what justify content does is that it allows us to adjust the flex items along the main axis. So in this particular instance, it's the horizontal axis. And there are two categories of values. So we've got things like center and end. These start center and end, these are positional keywords, which adjust the flex children's absolute position within the flex container. And then we, we also have the space set space around, space between, and space evenly, and these disperse the extra space between the flex children. 
Now, when it comes to the cross axis or the vertical axis, the items are stretched to the full height of a flex line the moment you apply a display flex on the parent. So this is, these are not the original heights of my items. If I want to see what the original heights are, I'm going to apply a, turn this off, going to apply a align items property, let's do end. These are actually the, the original heights of my elements, right? And one interesting value that I don't see used very often is baseline. Because if you have something like what I have here, it's a variety of sizes, a variety of alignments, a variety of font sizes, you'll see that the text is kind of like mountainous, and it's pretty hard to read. So if you have, say, text within flex items that are related to each other, and you want your audience to, say, comprehend something from the words, you could consider using baseline, and it makes everything a bit more readable. I thought this property, uh, this value was particularly interesting. Uh, one more thing is align content. So what you can do is say your flex container is larger than the size of your flex lines. I'll just put an arbitrary value of, say, 90 VH, right? So you're going to get these unsightly gaps. And what the align content property does is that it allows us to pack the flex lines. So if I set a value of, say, start, it sort of packs all your flex lines up to each other. If that's the effect that you want, and then you can sort of shift the entire block along your flex container as well. So these, flex al these box alignment properties are really handy when it comes to aligning boxes along a vertical axis, which is something that was really challenging in the past. And now let's cover some common use cases. This is, I know this is probably an example that everyone has shown, but I, I want to show it because I really like it, and that is auto margins. Again, they are your friend. If you had one item in your flex container, instead of using the box alignment properties, you can just set a margin of auto to center it. One line solves all your problems, because unlike in the current implementation of margins in a block formatting context, using margin auto will center the item uh, vertically as well. And if you have an additional item, so let me replicate boxy the box. Ah. And when I highlight it, you'll notice that it too has an equal amount of margin around it, right? So this is potentially an easy way of sort of aligning your stuff, like centering your items. Now, a more common, a more practical use case, I would say, is like a navigation bar, where sometimes you need this end link all on its low, lonesome on the right. And rather than struggling with you know, floating left, floating right, right, whatever, you can just use a margin left auto to kick it all the way to the right and call it a day. You can also make use of the alignment properties to make sure everything is centered vertically. So it's like a two-line, maybe three-line fix for a very common design use case. And then there's also this card-style card layouts because you know, everyone likes to design cards these days. Rachel did a very extensive uh, demo earlier. So my point here is just that you can change the flex direction whenever necessary. So for example, this card, I've set the flex direction to column. And if you would like this button to sort of kiss the bottom of the container, what you do is that you would want to grow your main content, and then that works. Uh, of course, like Rachel said, it's probably better to just use subgrid. But um, if you can't use subgrid, then this is potentially a good solution for a another common uh, design that we have to build most of the time in our day jobs. And now I think I'm running out of time, so moving on to the next thing. I want to talk about this rather fascinating thing that I discovered when I was playing around with CSS, uh, modern CSS layouts is that flexible sizing, or what I call responsive design powered up. Uh, it's, we've covered some flexible sizing units when we talk about flex, and all these sizing units are also available in grid. And what grid also introduces is this thing called an FR unit which is a fraction of free space. It also introduces a min-max function, which is a range of values. So with this, with FR, with min-max, with uh, fit content and auto, we now have a set of values that allow us to have variable rates of change. 
previously, what we've done is we've always used relative units like percentages or maybe the newer viewport units. But the limitation is that they make all your elements change size at the same rate. So I'm going to show an example. So this is, uh, this is something that's sized with percentages. So the width of my cat picture is 65%, while the width of the content is 35%. It kind of only works well within a very limited range. So from here to maybe here, it's kind of OK. But if you go any smaller, then you're like, oh, no, the image is too small. The words are weird. And then when you go big, like, no, the image is too big. The words are too small. So, so this is kind of um, a limitation of having the same rate of change for all your items. So what flexible sizing I find extremely interesting is, so to explain it, I'm going to do some isolated use cases. So first thing, let's compare. FR units versus auto. Now, because Rachel has already covered how useful the grid inspector is, so I just want to reiterate her point this morning, is that if you're going to be playing around with grid, whether you're just starting out or you're already using it for production, you know, Firefox probably is your best bet because of the grid inspector. And again, you can toggle it by clicking the grid tag, or you can go to the layout. And that's where you get to select, because I have tons of grids, you, you get to select multiple grids. If, if you're using nested grids or like multiple grids on the same page, this is pretty useful for you to check. So that's the inspector. But now we're actually going to talk about how these variable sizing units behave. So green, this is the legend. Green is FR, blue is auto. And like I mentioned, FR is a fraction of leftover space in a grid container. So whenever there is extra space, anything sized with FR is going to take all the content first. But it's also the first to have space taken away when there's not enough space. Auto will take up as much space as necessary without breaking lines. So it's kind of like max content, but not as rigid. So both of these values, they actually do take up free space when it is available. Now, the difference, you can see the difference when they, are, they, are, they work together. So when there's FR, FR takes up all the available space, and auto just you know, stays in its own lane, like max content, and that's fine. When there's not enough space, however, so now I'm referring to this third set of content, FR is going to shrink first. It's going to keep shrinking until it hits its minimum size before space starts taking, getting taken away from auto. So that's the difference in the behavior. At the end of the day, they all still shrink to a minimum size of min content. But the auto will hold its width while all the free space is absorbed and taken away by FR-sized columns first. That's the one thing to keep in mind. The second set of values that I want to compare is actually fit content and min content. So again, it's orange versus uh, gold. So fit content and min max actually behave very similarly in that they are both a range of values with a minimum and a maximum limit. So min max takes two arguments. As you can see here, I've set it to a minimum size of 200, a maximum size of 400. And we've also covered what fit content does earlier. So I'm not going to talk about that. So let's just do this resizing thing again, because isn't this what everybody does? No, nah, I'm just kidding. So when there's a lot of space, FR just takes up everything. I think we've already established that. But when there isn't enough space, again, FR is the first to lose content. Now, if we look at the first example, you'll notice that the moment FR is done shrinking, auto and fit content shrink at the same rate. So essentially, they behave very similarly. It's the same rate. But if you look at the second set, where this gold box is min content, and then it's auto and fit content, so I'm going to do this a bit slowly. Auto, will, auto had, more space, had, had free space allocated to it, so it's going to give it up first. Give up, give up, give up, give up. When you hit, they, both, they, they don't shrink anymore. Space starts getting taken away from min max. Because min max is a range between 400 and 200, so it can move between those, those values. It gets taken away, but at some point, auto and fit content also start shrinking. Specifically, what this point is, I can't tell you. But what I can tell you is that all three of these items are going to hit their minimum size at the same time. So the moment it goes, 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 
at the same time. So the, the minimum size is 200. So just to prove a point, it is 200 and min content. So I found this really, really interesting. And it's the same, it's the same case if you compare auto and min max, min max with fit. It's the fact that they behave similarly, but there is a variable rate of change. Now, in a grow, this is in a shrink scenario. In a grow scenario, when there's a lot of space, fit content is going to end up getting capped at its maximum con max content size or whatever's inside fit content. For this particular example, it's max content size because do we like boxes doesn't make up 200 pixels. That's fine. But if we look back at the second example, as we grow, the moment we hit the cap, fit content stops because it's set. What auto does is that it will hit its max content width, and then again, it will pause growing, let min max finish growing to 400 before it starts taking all the additional space. So I think this is a very interesting behavior that we've never seen before. This is something that is relatively new, and I think there are a lot of possibilities when it comes to more editorial design, because it allows us to do designs that adapt better to a wider range of viewport sizes. So here I have an example, uh, like maybe feature article. And this first bit is percentage sized. The bottom bit uses the newer uh, like variable sizing units, or as, as I call them, they look fine at this width. But the moment you start to shrink and you hit more extreme widths, you can start to see that this ends up having the same problem as the cat example, where you know it doesn't work very well, it, image too small, content too squashed. But if we just have the ones that is sized with the newer CSS properties, here it's a grid, right? And you can sort of see the code. It's not that straightforward. But what happens is that it functions a lot better at the more extreme with because of this variable sizing behavior. And also, a grid makes it very easy to do overlap. So this having a title overlap your image is a very trivial thing to do if you're using grid. And so I'm very excited for all of this stuff that I just mentioned to become more mainstream and to have more you know, designers and developers start considering the possibilities in their design. So if you're still on the fence in, in using any of these newer CSS layout properties, my message to you is just do it. Thank you very much.